David is going to show us some really cool tool. Hopefully. You can, go, you can get started. OK, so uh, hello, everyone. I am Davide Miola, and I'm a PhD student at Politecnico di Torino in Italy. And today I'm going to talk about what was basically my uh, master's thesis since I just graduated last week. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, it, it is about uh, measuring the Linux kernel's network stack CPU consumption and trying to isolate it from basically everything else. So this is today's agenda. First, I'm going to introduce the problem and talk about why I think that it, it, it's important. And then we go, we're going to move to the design and implementation phase, where I, I will also briefly talk about some of the um, main challenges that I faced during the development of the solution. And then we're going to see what kind of results we can expect and get out of my solution. And finally, I will conclude the talk with uh, current limitations and future uh, development potential. OK, so what is the uh, question that I'm trying to solve? Well, it's actually, actually uh, really simple. Uh, we all know that uh, implementing uh, networking functions in software is slow and expensive. And the main reason behind this is that um, modern uh, general purpose computing systems are not very efficient at moving packets around. And this is a problem because uh, we need to do this, especially for virtual networking concerns. For example, uh, the cloud native uh, software uh, concept requires that uh, services talk to each other and usually they are on the same host. And so this is a one understood problem, but what I think is uh, less understood is uh, just how much uh, this, this is costing us in terms of CPU cycles. And why is this important? Well, I strongly believe that uh, the uh, measurement phase should be the, the first phase for trying to optimize any kind of system. And so hopefully in the future, this tool can become uh, an important tool for system administrators to maybe allow them to better tune their servers and also give them the possibility to assess by themselves whether uh, offloading a portion of the network stack to dedicated accelerators would make sense. OK, so how do I fix this, or how do I solve this problem? Uh, well, since there used to be no uh, dedicated tool that's ready to use and can just give me the numbers I need out of the box, I decided to build my own. And this is how Nato came to be. And Nato is a Rust application that uses eBPF for uh, tracing the kernel and trying to measure uh, the network stack CPU utilization. Uh, OK, so as for the background, when I made these slides, I also included one that explains what eBPF is. Uh, but <laughs> I now realize that it's probably redundant in this context. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I will just skip it. And OK. Uh, another um, important kind of information that's, uh, I, I believe, required to understand how Nato works is a high-level overview of the kernel stacks architecture. Uh, this is probably also not required to explain in this context, but uh, uh, there is one concept which I, I still want to, to, to say, and that is that uh, in any modern operating system, the network stack is, in fact, composed of two separate entities. And those are the receive side and the send side of the stack. And these are usually uh, quite different. Uh, and the reason is, is very simple. And it comes down to, a down to the fact that on the receive side, the event of receiving a packet is, uh, by nature, asynchronous with respect to uh, well, code that's been running, that's running on the local host. And so it has to be handled with uh, interrupts. Uh, in this uh, picture here, you can see the green path. Uh, it represents uh, the journey of a packet that's being received on a NIC. And as it is received, the NIC will uh, copy the received data to host memory with DMA and then raise an interrupt. And the interrupt will uh, uh, make the CPU run the NIC driver's code, which, as you, as you probably know, is split into a top and a bottom half. And this is not something that's unique to NIC drivers, but it's actually quite common across a variety of device drivers. And this is done because the top half, which is the interrupt handler, uh, needs to remain as thin and fast as possible. 
And in this uh, case specifically, uh, the interrupt handler, so the top half, basically only uh, calls the NAPI schedule function to request the later execution of the bottom half, which in Linux is implemented uh, with a software RQ, where basically uh, the, all, all of the packet handling logic is performed. And this particular software RQ is the NetRx software RQ, one of the two that are um, allocated to networking. And in the other direction instead, so when the uh, outgoing traffic, the situation is a bit simpler because um, it's the application itself that requests uh, data to be transmitted. And uh, this is done by writing on a socket, as you know. And uh, usually uh, this simplifies things because the entire transmit side of the stack is contained within the system call that's used to write to the socket. Okay, so having this out of the way, how does that work? Uh, well, at a high level, it's really straightforward. Uh, first, I had to uh, identify the main entry points to internal networking. And as it turns out, there's mainly four. I know I'm missing a few, uh, but these are the main ones. And these are the two uh, networking-related software queues. So one of them is the NetRx software queue, which was the uh, cloud that was uh, pictured before. And the other is the NetDx software queue, which despite having a similar name, doesn't actually do that much in Linux. And it's only invoked uh, when a transmission attempt fails because the NIC uh, was found to be busy. So this picture is actually not quite accurate in terms of the, where the NetDx software queue is placed, whatever. And the other two entry points are the socket receive and send operations, of course. And so at this point, I just attach a pair of eBPF programs to each of these entry points, one at the, at the entry and the other at the exit of these entry points uh, in order to measure their own CPU time. And uh, the sum of these numbers is, or should be, uh, what I'm looking for. Uh, so uh, in this slide, you can see at the top uh, the choice, uh, the concrete choice of attachment points and BPF program types. And at the bottom, uh, what, I, uh, what, what is the uh, typical scenario that I expect most of the time? So in this particular example, at some point in time T1, uh, a, an entry point, in this case, the NetRx software queue, will enter the CPU and leave it at time T2. And what we're interested in is the difference T2 minus T1, which we can just compute by attaching a program to be uh, run at T1 and one to be run at T2 and just uh, extracting these timestamps. Unfortunately, this is not the only possible uh, scenario. And there's a, a couple of them that are a bit problematic. Uh, one of them um, refers to the fact that uh, two of, of the entry points that I described before are software queues. And as you know, software queues in Linux can be run in interrupt context. They can also be run in the case of the RQ, uh, the kernel threads, uh, but, but they, they can also be run in interrupt context. And so they, uh, they can interrupt other tasks. And in particular, it is possible for software queues to interrupt tasks on which uh, socket operations were already running. And in, if this happens, uh, the result is incorrect measurement, of course. So how do you fix this? Uh, well, first, uh, you need to, and this is what, this is what Neto does, of course. Uh, first, Neto uh, marks each task with an ID that identifies uh, what socket operation is running on that task, if any. And just as an implementation detail, I'm using a, a task storage map for this uh, because it's basically ideal. And if you're not familiar with uh, task storage maps, they are basically uh, functionally equivalent to hash maps that are keyed by a, the, the task PID, uh, but they are, for once, more efficient because you can access data just by basically the referencing in the task struct pointer. And uh, they are also more convenient in this case, particularly because uh, I do not need to worry about uh, map size or um, removing past entries. Okay, so. At this point in the software queue entry and exit uh, eBPF probes, I just need to read these flags and uh, use them in order to uh, stop, uh, stop um, accounting time for interrupted tasks on the entry and resume it at, at the exit, if applicable. And similarly, at the second problematic case, 
has to do with the fact that these um, socket send and receive operations are instead hosted on normal process context. And so they are uh, subjected to the Linux scheduler uh, preempting them and migrating them across cores. And the solution is actually really similar to the previous one, uh, but we need to inject into the BPF, uh, yeah, into the BPF layer of Nato every uh, decision that's taken by the Linux scheduler. And you can do this, of course, by also tracing the scheduler. And thankfully, there's this very convenient trace point, which is the sched switch that's invoked at, ev at every switch. Um, and so in this program, I basically do the same thing that I was already doing in the so software queue entry and exit uh, BPF programs by reading the uh, flag uh, that, that is in the task storage map. Okay, so um, as I explained it so far, Neto is perfectly capable of producing the number that I was looking for at the beginning. So the, this is a monolithic uh, cost of the uh, entire network stack, which as I said, can be useful probably, I guess. Um, but what I think is even more useful is trying to break this cost down into the, uh, the components that make it up, like every uh, network functions like bridging or forwarding. And ideally, uh, to do this, you would break, break down every entry point, uh, every component of, the, of this cost. And just to be clear, Neto does not implement this. Uh, but what Nato implements is the breakdown for one of the four entry points, which is the network software queue. And the reason is that it's probably the most important. And in the network software queue, you can find bridging, forwarding, uh, local delivery, and a few other functions. And so how do you do this? Uh, well, uh, during uh, development of Nato, I uh, developed a couple of different solutions. Uh, the first one, which is on your left, I, and uh, which I called full functions tracking, is a mere uh, extension of the set of functions that are being tracked in the BPF. And it's conceptually really simple, uh, but unfortunately, the result is very complex code, and in particular, eBPF code. And the reason is that you need to take into account uh, the, the structure that links these functions together. For example, uh, if you know how bridging is implemented in Linux, uh, well, if you don't know, I'm going to explain it now. So uh, <laughs> bridging in Linux is implemented as a receive handler. So it, it is, in theory, a generic uh, functionality, which I believe is only used by bridging code, that allows a function to be registered on, a, uh, on an interface for it to be run at every incoming packet. And for bridging, this is the bridge handle frame function, which is registered for all uh, interfaces that are part of a software bridge. But the problem with this implementation, uh, it's not actually a problem with bridge itself, it's a problem with Nato, is the fact that uh, bridge handle frame can call native receive SKB recursively um, when you set an IP address on the virtual bridge device itself. And you have to take this into account in BPF code, which is not particularly convenient. And, and so the, the end result is that full functions tracking is really slow. And in a couple of slides, we're gonna see just how slow it is. And I was surprised. And so the alternative is network stack sampling, which attempts and succeeds, no spoiler, to uh, mitigate this performance um, characteristic by uh, trading a bit of measurement accuracy for much lower overhead, and it can do. Uh, sorry, it can do that by uh, sampling the kernel side of the stack trace on all CPUs at regular intervals, and and doing this, of course, in the BPF, and then moving all of these traces to the uh, user space controller where they can be analyzed and used to extract useful information from, and also drive the additional metrics. And to do that, it uses uh, an EBPF program attached to a perf event that is set up to trigger at a set frequency on all CPUs, of course. And the end result is that it is, well, first of all, it's much cleaner. And so I believe uh, the more elegant solution, and it's also much, much faster. OK, so this slide basically says what I've already described for full functions tracking. And this is at the, the performance that you can expect out of full functions tracking. So in this graph, you can see uh, 
an IPERF3 uh, TCP receive test where Nero was loaded on the receiver and conducted with generic receiver flow disabled in order to uh, stress the system and make it so that the CPU is the bottleneck in, and not the link speed. Um, and it's also been conducted for two different configurations. The blue ones are without any bridging whatsoever. And in the red uh, configuration, the receiving interface is part of a bridge. And as you can see, when you uh, load Nero, which is the, the um, central couple of bars, uh, performance can drop, worst case, as much as 46%, <laughs> which basically means that uh, the instrumentation cost is almost as high as the entire rest of the network stack. Okay. <laughs> uh, but what I also believe is uh, interesting is that if you um, leave all BPF uh, probes attached to their usual entry points, or, or attachment points, rather, but empty them out so that they don't uh, perform any instructions, and this is the rightmost bars, the overhead is, is still significant. And the reason for this is that, the, of course, there's a cost to B BPF instrumentation itself. And in this case, I'm tracing functions that are run, uh, that are run very frequently. Um, most of them are run for every incoming packet that at these speeds is, and with generic receiver flow disabled is in the millions of times a second. And so the BPF instrumentation overhead is amplified, of course. Okay, so moving to network stack sampling, I already explained uh, basically what it is and how it works. And one of the main uh, design choices that I had to make during development was how do you move potentially thousands of uh, stack traces from uh, BPF to the user space every second? Because just to give you a, a reference number, a, a sampling frequ frequency that works well as I, as I have found, is one kilohertz. You can go a bit higher, you can go a bit lower, uh, but it, that's the ballpark. And first option that you probably would think, and that's what I thought as well, is to use the dedicated stack trace map. Uh, but unfortunately, as far as I could see at least, uh, it doesn't provide any way to uh, efficiently retrieve multiple traces at once. And so you're stuck doing uh, more than one system call for each trace, which is not ideal. I didn't even bother implementing this. And the, uh, the promising alternatives are the uh, bottom two in this slide. And first of all, the ring buff, which is probably what most of you thought right away, uh, as it is the idiomatic way to stream a bunch of data from BPF to the user space. But since when, uh, when I started uh, working on this, I didn't know the ring buff was a thing. Uh, I developed developed my own uh, solution, which is based on a normal array, which uses the uh, uh, FM mappable flag, so that uh, the memory can be mapped to the uh, application's uh, address space, uh, so that it can be accessed from the user space directly without any system calls. Um, and it also uses double buffering as to not lose traces that are accumulated uh, when the when the user space is uh, cycling through them. And so, which one of these uh, is better? Um, well, as it turns out, in terms of uh, overhead to the uh, um, to the throughput on the data plane, they perform basically identically. Um, but it seems that uh, the overhead on the user space uh, slightly favors the lower level uh, do-it-yourself array, a mappable array solution. So, I mean, why not give up a, a fraction of a percentage of CPU utilization? And so this is what Nero uses uh, right now. Okay, so this concludes the um, design and uh, implementation phase. And what about the results? What, what kind of results can we get out of Nero? And in this slide, you, uh, you can see a couple of different uh, graphs that are automatically generated in real time by Nero. And these refer to two different uh, workloads. Uh, on your left is an IPERF3 uh, UDP receive test, uh, whereas on your right is a test which is a bit more uh, uh, representative of the typical web server workload, 
where the Google's online boutique microservices demo was loaded uh, with about uh, 1,000 or so requests every second. Uh, but anyway, uh, focusing on the picture on your left, the kind of information that you can get out of it is, well, first of all, how uh, does CPU time split between the CPU being idle, uh, running user code or kernel code? Of course, this is not computed by Nero. This just comes from ProcFS. And then you can see uh, for the kernel time, how, it, uh, how much of it is allocated to networking tasks. And in this particular case, uh, you can see that about 50% of the kernel time is spent in networking tasks, whatever that means. And this to me was uh, at the beginning a bit surprising because uh, the, the processor is literally only uh, receiving UDP datagrams. So what, what is that other section? And this brings us to how the tool was validated. And during validation, I made heavy use of flame graphs. Um, and this, uh, we've already seen a few instances of this um, yesterday and today, I believe, as well. Uh, but basically, a flame graph uh, is a representation of the, of the overall system activity uh, that is uh, made by plots in a bunch of uh, stack traces. And since I was already capturing stack traces for network stack sampling, I, uh, I, I also decided to, to do this. Of course, you cannot plot a uh, flame graph in real time. It's not feasible, uh, but it's useful for, for validation. And here you have a, an annotated version. And you can see how uh, most of the time is being spent by the CPU being idle. Of course, this is expected. Also expected is a couple of, uh, of green spikes that represent the networks of their queue. And then on your, okay, on your left, uh, this is the uh, system call section where we have a light blue spike that is the uh, read system call, which is also being caught by Nero. But we also have a pink uh, select that together with this black system entry overhead, which was particularly uh, significant in this case, uh, it makes up for about 50% of the kernel time that was missing. There's also this spike, which I hope to hide under the rug, <laughs> which is just a result of how the graph is generated. It's, it's a write to the file system, basically, because I had to save these stack traces somewhere. OK, so uh, to conclude uh, this talk, uh, just a, a quick mention of the current uh, limitations. And basically, it comes down to the fact that, by design, Nero only really measures uh, in-kernel networking. And so we are missing everything that's implemented in user space, uh, like quick uh, user space TLS or any kind of um, custom data plane that's implemented in user space. And as far as, as future work is concerned, I believe that one uh, interesting prospect would be to um, try and move the entire uh, measurement stack to uh, to a sampling-based solution, like I am already do doing with um, network stack sampling, to better suit uh, higher speed networks. Because already at 40 gigs, you can almost see uh, some um, override just by tracing the software queue entry and exit uh, trace points. And I believe that going uh, above this speed, like 100 gigs and forward, uh, this is probably going to become a source of, uh, of overhead that maybe we can avoid by, by just sampling everything. And with that, I have concluded my presentation and thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you. No questions? Wow. Okay. So thank you for your presentation. It looks very cool. Thanks for using I-40E. <laughs> yeah, that's um, where uh, <laughs> the XL uh, 710 I, I worked on the driver, so okay. um, the The question I have for you is, is what kind of stuff did you see while running the tool? So any any conclusions from the tool itself? Like, um, 
surprises? Uh, I, I mean, not really, to be honest. <laughs> I, I can, for example, show you um, um, the, the tool uh, running on a, let's say, toy uh, cluster that we have in university, which is just like five or six nodes that we use to um, to give you uh, students VMs um, for exams and such. And it's been running for like a month or even more. And this is the kind of results that you can expect. Like here you can see that the uh, uh, average CPU utilization in, in total is about 20% in this particular machine. And the networking related CPU utilization drops to like less than 1%. And there's like some spike here and there that goes up to three or 4%, which in this particular CPU means uh, one full core. But yeah, that's about it. Uh, I mean, I, I guess you kind of have to have something to look for when, you, when you're decoding this, this data, so. Thanks. Yeah. How are you measuring the power there? This is on a VM? Uh, yeah, uh, no, this is not, not a VM. Uh, power is, is being measured with the Intel Rappel. With the what? Uh, Intel Rappel, which is an interface, an MSR-based interface that gives you uh, power-related data. It looks very low, that's why. And so, so you think that is all that networking is using? Uh, I mean, this is just a... A simple linear rela relation because we can't really do any better. But yeah, I mean, networking is using less than, in this moment less than one percent of the total CPU. Okay. So yeah, that's it. Okay, there are remote people. Can we please make it a habit to move to remote? So I have a question, quick. Um, I guess, like, how do you see people using this tool? Like, for what purposes? Just curious. I mean, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> um, I really have no idea. <laughs> it's cool, anyway. It's a, it's a good answer, I mean. So you have mentioned that uh, you plan to use this with uh, user space tracing as well, or is something that you are missing or do you, do you plan to, to have user space uh, for these uh, protocols in user space? Uh, uh, I, already in this state, Nero is composed of a eBPF layer and a user space kind of controller that, for example, updates the uh, the user facing report, like the Prometheus. But you have in your last slide, I think you, you mentioned what is missing or maybe the future work. And you mentioned uh, using the Tracing as, as well in user space, right? I'm not sure I'm following you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it comes down to do we want to do that? Do we want to also track user space network functions? I, I guess it's possible. Maybe it's a bit more difficult to. Well, it is possible to to have in the same trace user space tracing yeah, with the no, kernel. Technically, yes, of course, it's possible. But uh, do we know what processes are running uh, network functions, for example? Okay. No, I'm I'm asking that because have you used that in embedded systems for tracing uh, user processes and user space with kernel? But with networking, I think is more more challenging because uh, all the High performance uh, that uh, comes with with networking. So I, I was wondering if if you are not doing that because it's a technical uh, problem. Or... Uh, no, I'm just not doing because not doing it because it wasn't an original or, or rather uh, one of our goals originally. Okay. So okay, thank you. Hi, over here. I have a question. Um, how does Neto differ from um, tools that can kind of sample the entire system, right, and plot flame graphs uh, yeah. and whatnot? And like, do you, have you compared the results? Let's say I'd be interested to see, like, do you see different results when you do like a system-wide sampling and I you plot a flame graph? I have compared results, but the, uh, what I think should, uh, 
let's say, differentiate Nato from other maybe similar solutions is the fact that uh, this is foolproof and it only really gives you this data. Uh, of course, you can extract this same information in a more DIY solution, probably. Uh, but yeah, this is supposed to be like ready to use and yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one more question. There's a question there and then we'll take yeah, online and, and just a, a comment oh. to follow up on the question of like, how would you, how, how do you want to use this or where would you want to use this? Um, um, at a, you know, big environment like Google's, we really care about where our cycles are spent in both the kernel and user space network layers and are pretty eagle eyed to look, for, look for regressions at certain layers and attributing, um, attributing costs to particular functionality or particular processes is actually very hard. So that's where for continuous testing in a large scale, this is a perfect tool. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess uh, if you can uh, find a use for it, <laughs> then uh, I'm all for it. There's a question uh, on yeah. What is the heaviest subsystem part you have seen so far? Uh, well, it kind of depends on the workload, but usually um, the forwarding uh, network function is the one that's been hit the heaviest. Uh, I, I guess it makes sense. Other than that, yeah, it really depends on the workload. Okay, thanks. Let's oh, go it one more question, oh, if possible, Where here. I look? Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, please go ahead. Um, did you consider how hard it will be to implement the attribution to the process uh, that is consuming network and this is just to add on top of Willem's command? Yeah, at first I considered this as a possibility, but I'm not sure it is actually technically possible because once you receive a packet in the network software queue, you, you don't know you don't have the, socket, the right? process. Until it's... TC level, but past TC, you should, like one socket is created, you should be able to map it, right? Uh, yeah, maybe, but you probably have to like, still measure the overall network software, for example, cost, and then split it into the processes that are actually receiving data later, I think. Oh, that's what I would do, probably. Yeah, you could probably tag the SKB or something, maybe. And then you can ac account it somehow. Anyway, maybe. thanks for... Thank you. ...for giving us this talk. Thank you.